Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone. If you're visiting with us, we want to extend a special welcome. I ask you to stick around for a couple minutes in the carport that we might get a chance to visit with you afterwards. Just a reminder, this service will be recorded and posted on YouTube for those who are unable to be here. I want to make sure that everyone has communion. If you have not picked up a communion packet, raise your hand and uh, we'll get one to you. Remember, there are individual packs in the carport. If you, uh, if you are at home listening and you are in need of individual packs, they are in the carport. Pick them up any time or let one of us know if you can't get up here and pick them up and we will get them to you. Reminder about our Wednesday night Bible study is at 7 p.m. on Zoom. It's been a great study. It's a great midweek unwind and, and uplift for everybody that's there. It's, it's pretty cool. Reminder about tax statements. If you need one, contact Vince. He can make that happen. A few congregational announcements. Keep Robin Reynolds in your prayers. She is in the hospital undergoing tests right now. Um, she's having a heart problem, so keep her in your prayers. Also, Tony Malta, who is at Shelby Nursing Home for rehabilitation from a hip replacement. Remember all those who are grieving loss. Uh, we've got at least three that I, I could name right off that have lost loved ones or friends, so keep them in your prayers. Also, Sister Courtney Reese, who is recovering from ankle surgery. Our brother Rick Hughes, who's having health problems. And Chris's cousin, Joe Lacito, is still in a hospital with COVID, so keep them all in your prayers. Just a reminder about the Furnace Fund. Uh, we want to thank everyone for your help. It's not over, but it's doing awesome. You know, we started out, the, we replaced six furnaces and six air conditioners. When we ran out of duct tape and bread tie fixes, we had to do it. So we replaced six furnaces and six air conditioners cost of around 55,000. Uh, we ended up financing around 35,000. And at this point, it's been not quite, it hasn't been a year, but it's getting there. Uh, we are around 5,000. So, you know, when we put things in front of this congregation, this congregation always rises to the occasion and we are just so blessed. Remember, after uh, closing prayer, we will dismiss from the back and we will hopefully head right outside and enjoy some sunshine and fellowship in the parking lot before we leave. With that, would you go with me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning thankful, dear Lord, for this opportunity, this privilege we have to come together and to worship you together, dear Lord. We pray that you will Bless our worship service. We pray that it is edifying and uplifting to everyone here. But most of all, dear Lord, we pray that our worship is acceptable to you. These things we pray in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. This morning's songs are listed to my left. Or if you're following at home, they're right in front of you, I believe. They'll be on the screen. But if you would turn with me to 311. 311. My hope is... All other ground is sinking sand When darkness veils his lovely face 
I rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale. My anchor holds within the veil. The heart Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His hope is gone. Today's scripture reading will be coming from Proverbs, chapter 27, verse 19. It's Proverbs, chapter 27, verses 19, and it reads, Just as water reflects the face, so one human heart reflects another. Let us pray. Dear most gracious Lord, we come to you now thanking you for blessing us with another day. We thank you for allowing us to be here and worship you and give you the praise that you deserve. We pray that as we go throughout this worship service that we praise you with all our hearts and with clear minds. We pray that the message that is taught today, that we keep it in our hearts and in our minds, and that we make the message make us better Christians, better sermons for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Prepare for the Lord's Supper. If you'd turn with me to 496. I know I'm going to sound broken record from the last time I song led. Normally I try to take something thematically slow and reflective for the Lord's Supper. Um, I'm still not used to picking four songs instead of five. And I got a little bit missed here, but. Um, if you'd turn with me to 496, this world is not my home. The message is still good. The message is still true. I don't want to stretch too much to, to, to try applying meaning, but um, um, you know, Jesus wasn't at home in this world either. And we are his blood now. So we aren't, you know, we're, we're with him in that. This world is not our home. Good term. Thank you. Sing. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the
We uh, now come together as one body gathered around the Lord's table and partaking of the communion in remembrance of his sacrifice to save us from our sins. I would like to read to you a few verses. The first uh, from Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 9. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ. 
Now also I'd like to read from chapter Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 9. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the, this world, and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming of ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And then finally, from Luke chapter 22, verses 19 through 20. And he, Jesus, took the bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which he poured out for you. Now, if you would all please take out your communion packets and peel back the top layer exposing the bread. And would you please bow with me as we give thanks for the bread. Dear Heavenly Father, dear Jesus, as we partake of this bread, which represents your body, the same body, Lord, that you put a crown of thorns on and put nails through your hands and feet, Lord, Help us remember your sacrifice, Lord, and your love for us. It's in your holy name these things we pray. Amen. Now if you'd peel back the second layer exposing the fruit of the vine. Let us go to our God and our Lord and Savior once more. Dear Jesus, as we partake of this fruit of the vine, which represents your blood, Lord, that same blood that was shed on the cross, the same blood, Lord, that washes over us and cleanses us of our sins. Once more, dear Lord, we thank you so much for your sacrifice, for your love, for the precious gift of salvation. It's in the holy name of Jesus Christ, these things we pray. Amen. We now have the opportunity, <clears throat> excuse me, to give back a small portion of what we've been so blessed with. And as Vince and I come around <clears throat> with the baskets, we ask you just please drop, <clears throat> drop your contributions into the basket. Thank you. Let us go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all your many blessings, Lord. 
Lord, we have this opportunity to give back a small portion of what we've been blessed with. We know it pleases you, Lord, for us to give back freely and willingly and not out of obligation. We ask, Lord, you will bless the monies gathered here and those in charge of their distribution. It's in Jesus' holy name these things we pray. Amen. You would now turn and mark song number 196. That will be song of invitation. And if you'd turn with me to 323. 323, Living by Faith. Jesus. 
to say good morning to you and again express how great it is to, to be here, to see you on this glorious first day of the week, to be seen, to be in the presence of individuals that love our Heavenly Father and understand the importance and the significance of worshiping our Heavenly Father in spirit and in truth. It's just a marvelous um, thing to be able to come and to, to worship God. It uh, is always, to me, an amazing thought that you and I as human beings can render unto God praise and, and obeisance and worship in a way that our Heavenly Father in his great majesty and in his, his excellent nature uh, can and that he will accept. Of course, we know that God does not and will not accept any worship. He has, of course, through his word, ordained uh, the manner in which we ought to worship and um, every aspect in which uh, we are to worship him and what we ought to render unto him. But it is a marvelous thing that you and I can, uh, as his children, worship him and God accept that worship. Be to him as a sweet-smelling savor. This morning I want to talk to you on the subject, uh, what man's heart reflects what man's heart reflects if you would go with me to our heavenly father in prayer our great god and father we do thank you and it's again that we praise you for all that you've given to us everything you've done we thank you so much lord for your son our savior jesus the christ lord we indeed we're, and still we are in need of a savior. And we're so thankful that you, uh, out of your great love, have provided for us, Lord, a means to be redeemed, Lord, and not only to be redeemed, but to be recognized as your children and to receive as Brother Dave read to us from Ephesians chapter one, a glorious inheritance um, because of the beloved. We are so grateful and we pray now that as we study your word, as we look at your word this morning, dear father, that our hearts will be encouraged and that we will be built up, that we will come to see the glory of your word and the manifold wisdom that is uh, expressed through your word, dear Father, and that uh, your word is able to make us wise, Lord, not only to give us uh, a holy life, but to make us wise. And so we pray and ask, dear Father, that as we look at your word, that we are being more and more um, teachable, that we are learning, Lord, the value of your word and, and understanding your word and, and being receptive to your word. And more and more we're learning the value of looking past the speaker with his weaknesses, shortcomings and looking to you, coming to know Lord on our own, that everything that is good and, and right and true and eternal belong to you and all the mistakes Lord belong to the speaker. These things we pray and ask in Jesus glorious name, amen. This morning we go again to the Proverbs. And I will just uh, be honest with you. I don't want to minimize the value of the book of Proverbs. I love the book of Proverbs immensely because again, it has been such a, a, wonderful, um, a wonderful source of, of wisdom for my own life personally. But the book of Proverbs is again a book that does the very thing. It talks to us and speaks to us in many instances about um, living from day to day. And this morning we want to look at again uh, another proverb, this time from the 27th chapter, the 19th verse, Proverbs 27 verse 19. Now this proverb has various translations. And in other words, if we were to again take uh, a poll at, at what each translation that we have, and of course there will be various translations that we all have, whether it's the New Revised Standard Version, whether some of you have the King James Version or the NIV. And if you looked at this particular verse in all of those translations, they all have their own variation of Solomon's meaning here. Again, which is a result 
uh, of the various, and I will just say it, interpretations of some of the translators or how you even view what the translators are trying to say, which of course, in many instances, uh, has to be looked at very carefully. The King James Version, if you have that, inserts the verb answereth to make the beginning of the proverb sound like this. As in water, face answereth to face. But the verse does not, in the original, does not have the word answereth. It doesn't have uh, the verb, any verb there, in fact. And it literally says, as in water, face to face. So again, the seemingly lack of clarity, seemingly lack of clarity to its meaning has led to various interpretations and several different comments on this wise saying, this particular proverb. Now most can be dismissed because when we look at those particular um, ways in which those translators try to, to translate Solomon's meaning and his words, uh, we find that even these comments that are made, should we say, the, the commentators and their interpretation, for lack of a better term, can be dismissed because what they interpret is not found in other places of scripture, if that makes sense to you. But there are a, a few translations or a, a few commentators, commentators, should I say, that are more viable, commentators that are more viable and could also be Solomon's meaning. In other words, if you were to look at what commentators believe Solomon is trying to convey, many of them can be dismissed because they're not, these ideas are not backed up in scripture. We don't see these things in the Old Testament nor the New, but some of the commentators and some of their, their so-called interpretations uh, can be what Solomon is trying to say since they are, again, supported in other places of scripture. A few explanations are more viable and could be Solomon's meaning. For our study, we're going to go with the traditional view. There is a view that is a more traditional view, that is a more ancient view to this particular uh, verse. This view taken by most Hebrew scholars, most interpreters, we're going to ultimately look at that uh, this morning. Even though if you have studied this verse in preparation for this lesson, chances are you're going to say, well, that's not what I got uh, from that particular verse when I studied that verse. Now, we take our translation from the New Revised Standard Version this morning, and I want us to, 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 to hear how it is framed here. Since it translates closest to what Hebrew scholars believe was traditionally Solomon's meaning, it goes like this, as it was read by Chris, just as water reflects the face, and again, the word reflects is, is inserted here to give an idea from the Hebrew uh, and from other passages um, to give an idea of what Solomon was trying to convey. So it's not in the original, the word reflect is not there. But just as water reflects the face, so one human heart reflects another, is how the New Revised Standard Version puts it. So let's discuss two foundational implications from this proverb. I wanna give you two foundational implications. Number one, the source of water that Solomon is describing here that is reflecting the face as he's describing it is reliable. Now, we see in other words in, in other passages of scripture where water is, is used as a mirror. And so this is again why uh, scholars believe this is the idea that Solomon was portraying. And so again, I will repeat this first foundation. The source of water that is reflecting the face is reliable. We are supposed to look at this as a reliable source of reflection of the face that is being cast into the water. What I mean is that the inspired composer described a condition where the individual is gazing in clear, still water that gives off an accurate and a complete reflection of the face of the individual that is looking uh, into the water. The reflection is giving a complete answer to the gazer's face. Whatever is indicative of that person's face when others look at that person is equally seen when the person stares in if they were to stare into a clear, still, quote unquote, body of water. The water, in other words, is a reliable source of depicting the individual's face. That's the first thing that 
we have to see about what Solomon is saying here. But number two, the second foundational implication is that the human heart is the object that does the reflecting. In the second part of Solomon's proverb, he wants us to focus on, and the, the culmination of his idea in the first part of the proverb is to get us to understand the, the deepest part of what he's trying to get at, and that is the human heart. And so he likens, and, and with, with a simile-type language, he likens the heart to what? To, to water. And so in the style of some of the Proverbs, the heart stands as the reliable source of depiction. Just like it does in the first part, just like water does in the first part of his, his proverb, now the heart stands as a reliable source of depiction. The way water does in the first part of the proverb. Now, what some contend is whether Solomon is referring to a person's ability to get an accurate depiction of themselves by looking deeply, even gazing at their own heart. In other words, this is where many scholars began to, to deviate from one another. And then we're going to give you the traditional view. But there are some who believe that when Solomon is describing here is the individual looking at his or her own heart and, and that heart giving them a, an accurate depiction of who they really are. And, and so some commentators give that particular thought and they give that particular idea to what Solomon is saying. That the individuals that look at or into their own heart is able to see who they really are. This idea aligns, and it is true, it aligns with the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 15. If you were to turn there, Matthew chapter 15. In other words, the idea that they believe that Solomon is conveying here is what Jesus talks about in part in Matthew chapter 15. Look at verse number 10. Jesus says, he says, Then he called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand. Verse 11. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Go drop down to verse number 16. So Peter asks Jesus to explain the parable. Then he said, are you still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. And look at what Jesus says in verse 19. For out of the heart comes evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. In other words, they, they attribute uh, Solomon's words, the proverb, to what Jesus is saying here, is that by looking and observing the heart, by, by getting an understanding of one's own heart, they can get a, an accurate depiction of who they really are. And so that's how they believe Solomon is, is, is trying to, to speak and what Solomon is trying to convey. But the most common view is more general, and this is what we're going to look at today because I believe that it's the more traditional view that Solomon is, is saying here. And a lot of times we, we basically uh, lean towards what our translation says, but the translation is, is sometimes uh, influenced by the translator's idea and their perception of what Solomon was trying to say. So we're going to take the traditional view in its broad scope, meaning that as a man can get a reliable reflection from gazing and peering on the water, so a man can get a reliable reflection of mankind through and by gazing and looking at the human heart. In other words, Solomon, I believe, is talking about it in a more general sense, in a more broad sense, from man to man. In other words, by understanding the human heart, then I can get an understanding of what? Of man as a whole. And I can get a good depiction of man as a whole. In other words, human hearts, in many ways, they are what? They're similar. They're similar in terms of the inner man. Man's reasoning is, is similar from one man to the other. Man's thoughts are the same. Often his motives and his intentions, his desires and his imaginations, his purpose and his what? His passions and his aims in life. We often, because we're human beings, we're the same creature from one person to the other. We are similar in all of these things in terms of our mind and in terms of the human heart. Since God fashions the heart of all men, Psalm 33, verse 15. 
An example of this would be in animals. Consider any kind of animal. If you were to just in your mind think, pick an animal, whether it's a bird or of a bird of some kind. I don't know, when I was, was writing this sermon, I, I, for some reason the black bear came to mind. Go figure. <laughs> but obviously each animal, such as a black bear, is unique and possesses unique characteristics. If you were to look at each black bear, for example, individually, of course there are some unique traits to that, to that black bear, whether it's certain tendencies that that bear has and that can be recognized by that black bear or even some physical things concerning that particular animal. But though there are various differences, physical and otherwise, black bears generally have the same nature. You know, this is why we look at wildlife uh, challenge because if they're studying the black bear, they can talk about black bears in a general sense or a particular species of bird. They can tell you a lot of things about the, that bird in a general sense because those birds are similar and they are alike in their nature in many ways. And it's the same thing with what? With mankind. And I believe that this is what Solomon is, is describing here. So it is with man. Just as there are many unique things in every one of us, every one of us is unique in, in various ways and how we look outwardly and even some of our own uh, personal tendencies, but in, in terms of the nature of man and man's heart in a general sense, man's heart is generally the same in its nature. This is the meaning according to many Hebrew scholars. And again, I want us to look at it from the New Revised Standard Version again. Look at Proverbs 27 verse 19 because this is why they translate it this way. It says, just as water reflects the face, so one human heart reflects another. I think that's the more accurate way of, of, of looking at what Solomon is saying. So very quickly, I want to talk about three things to consider. And we're going to give these very quickly, much briefer than you're used to, uh, and then the lesson will be yours. Number one, the first thing to consider is that we can know ourselves better than by observing other folk. We can know ourselves better by observing the quote unquote heart of others. When we learn, and, and from a general sense, uh, man's reasoning and the way that man reasons, we are, again, we are a unique creature. We are unique from all other creatures that God has created. But we are, in, in a very real sense, generally speaking, man's intentions and man's reasoning, we generally, we are the same and when we are able to uh, come to know and understand other folk, we do, we learn something about ourselves. If you were to just look at it, look at your life, you learned much about yourself by, by not just observing yourself, but by what? Looking at others. Looking at other people and observing other people. That's a, a wonderful source of, of coming to, to know certain things about you and about the nature of man and, and being the creatures that we are. It is pride that often causes us to want to think that we, we think on a, a different level than other folk. You ever hear people say like that? Well, my thinking is, is different than everybody else. Uh, they, they classify themselves as having a higher way of thinking. In reality, if that is true, it's only because we have the mind of Christ that that happens because if we don't, generally speaking, man pretty much we think the same. And in the same situations, we pretty much think and act the same. We, we are the same creatures. But it's pride that causes us to want to think that our thinking or our, even our tendencies are different than others. We'd like to think that our intentions are naturally a little more pure, that our passions and desires are naturally more chaste than all others. But the reality is, in the general sense, we are all the same, and every heart is the same in nature. There is a reason why Jesus saved the world and had to come and save all of us, it's because we have a tendency as human beings that in certain situations, if God did not come and save us, we would all be led into what? Following our desires and the passions of our, our hearts in ways that are not conducive of holiness and godliness. We sometimes miss opportunities to understand ourselves because we fail to see our reflection being cast to us from the heart and the general way of thinking that others have. You know, we look at things in the world and we like to think that we would never do this or we would never do that. And a lot of times we said it because we've never been in that particular situation to know how we would act in that situation. But generally speaking, if we're honest about it, 
we are capable of doing this very same thing that others do, both good and bad, because again, we are all human beings. We are all the same creatures. When God intended for us to learn, in part, how we look at others, he intended for us to learn in this manner is what we're trying to say. Much of Solomon's understanding of himself, when you see all of his, his writings, of course, they're inspired of God, but when you see all of Solomon's writings and when you look at what he, he conveys in the book of Proverbs and in Ecclesiastes, he learns in various ways, but one of the ways that Solomon learned about himself is observing other folk through observation. And that's a wonderful source of learning more about who you are as, as a human being, as a person. Self-reflection can spring from gazing at the actions and the intentions of others. And it is by observing one another, it's by gazing at mankind that we learn man's great resilience and enduring heart. Have you ever looked at an individual and they inspired you to push harder because you saw the human spirit that that person has? You didn't know that you had it until you saw someone else convey it and then their inspiration rubbed off on you and it pushed you because you saw what one human being was capable of how one human being's thinking could raise them to heights that you never thought that you could reach. And you also accomplished something because of what? Because of the human beings that you saw accomplishing great things. And so it's by observing one another that we are able to learn grand, man's great resilience and his enduring heart, which leads to the praise of our creator. We praise God because God has made us in, in a way that we are resilient and that we are unique than all other creatures that God has made and man's weaknesses and his evil intentions in many cases, which leads to our reliance on his salvation. Again, we are saved because we have learned just how pit pitiful, pitiable that we can be as human beings. The reason why we obey the gospel and the reason why we worship God is because we have seen how low as human beings and as creatures that we can, we can crawl on the ground too. And we cried out to God to save us from this condition that we can sometimes fall to. And he did, and he sent his son. And so we learn this from seeing others. But number two, we can accurately know others by knowing ourselves too. That's obvious, isn't it? If the first is true, then the second has to be true. We can accurately know others by knowing ourselves. Now, there will be folk that will try to tell you, you know, that, they, again, that they are unique and that my situation is different than yours. And, but really, in essence, we, we do have a firm grasp on what one another, what we go through. We have a firm grasp on, again, what our capabilities are, the struggles that we have as human beings. And God made it that way so that we can do what? That we can help each other. He's made it that way. So you can help individuals that lack understanding of themselves to know themselves. <laughs> have you ever talked to someone? How have you helped your children? Your children have, had, when they were growing up, they had one type of thinking, and as parents, we're supposed to be able to convey to them that, hey, listen, I know what, I know that I do that even to this very day. I tell my kids, okay, if, if this is, if you're placed in this situation, it's not a situation that you want to be into because a, as a general rule, this is how human beings tend to act in this situation. And I know because I did that when I was in that situation. We help our children and we help others by understanding who we are as human beings. And this is how God wants it to be. To know ourselves is to be able to help others to know themselves, the general makeup of man. But also we can become more effective servants when we understand this, more effective servants. In other words, when I, through knowing myself and coming to know who I am as a human being, as a creature uh, uh, with human nature and human tendencies, then when, when I see others that are struggling, because I have struggled with these things, it makes me more sympathetic to folk too. You know, it, it makes me it gives me the ability to be more caring and more tender to folk, giving sympathy and mercy to those who are weak. And think about it in terms of Jesus. And again, I'm not likening you and I in this way to the Lord Jesus in terms of his high priestly order, 
But again, think about how the Bible describes Jesus and how he comes to earth and he's able to sympathize with our weaknesses because he was tempted in all points without sin, but he was tempted and, and tested in all points, but without sin. So he understands what the human experience, and it makes him a more faithful and a more merciful high priest in the service of God. We're not the high priest of God, but it can help us to be more merciful to individuals when we understand, again, by looking at ourselves, what other folk go through and what they're struggling with. But it also helps us to be accurate when we must rebuke and exhort others that are hard-hearted because we've been there too. And we know that that's also a part of, of our tendency and our inclinations as human beings is to be hard-hearted and to want to do what we want to do. And sometimes we have to rebuke others because we know that rebuke has worked on us in the past as well. So we can accurately know others by knowing ourselves. And then finally, the word of God is the greatest source of reflection. Again, I, there's a lot uh, that can be said about this, this wonderful verse, but I wanted to end with that thought. The word of God is the greatest source of reflection. We can learn a lot from knowing and, and coming to understand ourselves. We can learn a lot from coming to know and understand mankind through others. But again, the greatest source of reflection is the word of God. The psalmist says in Psalm 119, verse 105, he puts it this way. He says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path, your word. In other words, your word helps me in my walk in everyday life. Your word enables me to see Clearly, as I walk through this world, the, the power of God's word to help us and to understand ourselves better. In Hebrews chapter 4, the writer of Hebrews talks about the word of God. And we often talk about the word of God and being sword-like or being a sword, spiritual sword. But, but look at how he describes this in, in, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. He says, indeed, in other words, this is true. A true saying that indeed the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. And so now he talks about what the word of God is able to do concerning mankind. Piercing, it pierces us until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow, it is able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And before him, no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render a word or render an account. Greatest source of reflection is God's glorious word. If you really want to know who you are, what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, what you're capable of, who you are, to God, through Jesus Christ, it's through the word of God. Therefore, by the word, we are able to overcome. Whatever you see when you look at the word of God is not for the purpose of destroying us. That's not what God does. We, we've been studying the book of James. In James chapter 1, the Bible talks about the nature of God as God being what? A giver of good gifts, perfect gifts. And so God's intention in giving us his word is not to destroy us and to annihilate us. It is to what? To build us up and to make us what God wants us to be. Our brother uh, Dave read to us in, in his beautiful uh, leading of the Lord's table, Ephesians chapter 2, where the Bible says that he, for we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. God wants the greatest things for us, the, the most highest spiritual things for us. And so he has given us his word for us to look at his word as a mirror so that upon reflecting, we can become the best of ourselves through his son, Jesus the Christ. And this is why, again, in James chapter 1, verse 22, this is what he says. It's about giving us the ability to endure. Don't close your Bibles just yet. 
Open them up one more time. If, uh, James chapter 1, look at verse 22. He says, but be doers of the what? Of the word. Be doers of the word, and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror, or you can even say in a water in order to reflect, for they look at themselves and on going away, immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty and persevere, those who look at the word of God and they persevere, they endure, which is the intention of God. What happens? And being doers who forget, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. Isn't that beautiful that God wants to bless us? He wants to bless us. And the greatest source of reflection, the greatest source for you and I knowing who we are and what we're capable of without God and with God is the word of God. And so we need to look into the perfect law, the law of liberty. We need to persevere through and in God's glorious word. The purpose of God giving us his word as a mirror is to save us. And it is to bless us. If you're here this morning and you have not obeyed the gospel, whether you're here in this audience or whether you're listening virtually, we want to urge you today to please obey the gospel through faith, repentance, confession, and being baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. God promises upon your obedience to the gospel that on that day when he receives his own to himself that he will give you the crown of life that no man can take away, that never rusts or corrupts, provided you walk faithfully unto death. If this is your desire, but much more importantly, if this is your need, won't you come? And if you are a Christian and you need to come for the reasons that we spoke of or for anything else, won't you come right now? Why would you gather stand up while we sing?
We got a request from our sister Paula Sears to pray for her dad. He's 91. He's suffering with some lung problems. Uh, so keep Paula's dad in your prayers. Uh, go with me now as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this beautiful day, dear Lord, for this opportunity we've had to come together to worship you in song, to worship you in prayer, to hear your word read, to hear your word preached, dear Lord, to gather around this table and commune with you. We are so blessed to be your children. We pray, dear Lord, for Paul as dad, as he struggles with lung problems, dear Lord, we pray that you will hold him in your loving arms, heal him up, dear Lord. We pray for those who were mentioned in the announcements, those who are grieving, those who are undergoing tests, those who are struggling with their health, dear Lord, we, again, we pray for your healing arms. We pray for our travelers, dear Lord, Don and Sandy in Florida, others who are traveling, we pray that you will keep watch over them, dear Lord, and return them to us at the right time. Pray, dear Heavenly Father, as we leave this place, that you will guide our steps, guide our hearts, guide our, our every thought, dear Lord, that everything we say and do will be done in a way that will bring glory unto your name. Pray, dear Lord, for the leaders of this congregation, that you will guide us, that you will give us wisdom, dear Lord, and give us the courage to follow that wisdom. We pray for the leaders of our country, that when making decisions, dear Lord, they will seek your guidance. We pray, dear Lord, for the leaders of this world, all over the world, we pray the same thing, that they will seek your guidance, dear Lord, when making decisions. We pray that you will go with us now, dear Lord, as our paths go different ways. We pray that you will keep our hearts on that straight path to you, dear Lord. We pray that we can be a blessing to someone else this week. And we pray that we will always be a blessing to each other, dear Lord. We pray that you will guide our every move. Forgive us when we fail. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.